Heyo, welcome into CHGO White Sox Podcast, presented by DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook. Download the app today and use promo code CHGO when you sign up. Welcome into Studio A of our CHGO offices here in the West Loop of Chicago. I'm Sean Anderson, the host of the CHGO White Sox Podcast. You can follow me on Twitter, at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. We got a little bit of a different makeshift CHGO White Sox crew. We got Minnie Duber on his uh, honeymoon down uh, under, and uh, we got Jared Willis filling in. Uh, you can follow Jared on Twitter at J Willis, eyes instead of, or wise instead of eyes mm-hmm. um, on go. Twitter. Uh, and he is a CHGO beat writer covering the Sox and the Cubs. We got Herb Lawrence. Hello. Follow him on Twitter at Eckernwall23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. It is a little bit of a, a hectic MLB day. It's nice to have a little bit of action. Uh, we got some news for the free agents out there. We got some qualifying offers that were accepted. And also, we are f- now seeing the uh, deadline for the 40-man roster crunch. Uh, teams have to get in their 40-man roster before 5 p.m. Central today. And if they don't protect certain players, those players will be eligible for the Rule 5 draft. So we got a, a, you know, a little bit of a busy show here today. Uh, let's start with something that might affect the White Sox, or at least a former White Sox at this point, Jose Abreu, Anthony Rizzo. Resigned with the Yankees. Uh, he's going to get, I think, $40 million guaranteed. It's a two-year deal. That's, he's going to get $17 million in the first two years, and then there's also a third-year option. But Anthony Rizzo, nonetheless, is going to be in the Bronx for the next two seasons. There was, said, there was some reported interest from the Astros, uh, but he ends up returning to the Bronx. What do you guys make of the signing, and what does it mean for Jose Abreu's market? Good for him. He enjoyed his time in New York, and he has a a kinship with uh, Aaron Judge and uh, Giancarlo Stanton, as those guys like to joke around. And they're hoping that, you know, having Anthony Rizzo back is 30-plus home runs in that short porch in right field alongside Aaron Judge if they re-sign him will lead to more uh, future uh, better outcomes as they had than, than this year. Good for him. Enjoy your money. New York is a good place to be as if you can be successful out there there's no better place to be than New York but now Jose Abreu is probably catapulted up there as the guy okay we couldn't get Anthony Rizzo cool we're downshifting now Cubs Astros Padres other teams that need first baseman that don't that are on a trajectory for competing you can do that on any team if you have a a first baseman, if you are a team that's just middling and you just want a first baseman, but Jose Bray was not going to a team that's just middling. He wants to win a championship. The reason why he's probably leaving the White Sox is because the money, firstly, and then secondly, he has never really been in a competitive, on a competitive team that was ready for the championship. If he goes to Houston, already there. He goes to the Padres, already there. The Cubs are a little questionable. They're they're building, and I don't know if he wants to do that. The thing about the Cubs is that they're here. It's his home that he has known for the last nine years. So they have a shot, and they have interest in him. So I would think that he has plenty of options, and he'll be signing a nice deal upwards of $20 million a year because he's re- like leaving, what, 18 on the table or the, what the White Sox paid him last year. He should be getting paid more because of his years going forward are going to be just as good as the ones that preceded him. Really, he won an MVP in 2020. Yeah, I mean, just two years as ago. Good? Just two years ago. Right. I'm just saying, like, he's not falling off the table. You could say yeah. the home runs are falling off the table, but th- I think that's a, more of a symptom of the whole White Sox thing, not Jose Abreu specifically. I think he's going to continue his 30 home run thing on another team. Yeah, their their home runs as a team really fell off last year. So um, I don't know how much of that is just a, an Abreu thing and how much of that is a was a White Sox issue as a team um, in 2022. But yeah, one of the first things that I thought about when I saw the news that Rizzo was sticking around in New York was this really does have, a I think, a significant impact on Abreu's market because if, like, we saw the rumors about the Astros and Rizzo and he made a lot of sense for them, and if they're targeting first baseman, now your, your focus has to shift and – Abreu, who is probably already an appealing option for the Astros as well. Now maybe you double down in your pursuit uh, for Jose Abreu. And if the Cubs, we talked about this yesterday, but if the Cubs really are serious about trying to bring Abreu in to play first base, then I think their sales pitch gets a little tougher because now you, because you're right, I agree. He he wants a ring. 
Um, and they're a little harder sell when it comes to that because you're not nearly as close as the team that just won a World Series. And so maybe you really sell him on, you get to stay in Chicago. You don't, you know, this is still going to be your home. You're, you're still a, a representative of this city and that doesn't have to change. And maybe you sell him on, you're joining a, you're joining an organization that, no, we're not necessarily going to be a World Series team in 2023, but hopefully not that long afterward. And like the Cubs have done in the past, they're good at convincing guy A to sign because they tell them that, well, guys B, C, and D are coming down the road. Um, we've seen some past examples of free agents that have signed because they knew who was coming later. And maybe Abreu could be that kind of a signing for them. Right. They're may not know which shortstop, but they could say, hey, you're going to be the guy who's going to help bring in Trey Turner or Carlos Correa. Um, Yeah, I mean, that would be definitely interesting, but the Astros could be like, hey, see the rings? Yeah. See Reggie Jackson yelling at people in the front office? See his rings? See uh, Jeff Bagwell? He doesn't have any rings, but he's a Hall of Famer. You know, Jim Jim Crane's got some rings. Uh, What do you guys make of that situation? You hear hear, hear all the the rumblings out of Houston and and them letting uh, James Click the guy who just put together a World Series yeah. team as general manager, get out, leave the, the organization. Arch- architect of the whole thing. <laughs> uh, thanks for everything, but uh, <laughs> pack your stuff. Real. <laughs> yeah, it's wild to think that an organization that's from the outside, kind of looking in, seems like it's been run so well. Because look at their success over the last six years, and then as some of this is coming to light, like wow, it was it was kind of a train wreck there right. in a lot of ways. Um, it's surprising that the on-field product still looked so good. Right, but is it is it going to be the the castle crumbling down? Right. You know, is this going to be the the messy stuff? Because you just heard rumors that Houston was interested in Rizzo. So, like, did they possibly screw this up because they didn't have a, a general manager who could actually run the show? He was too mm-hmm. busy fighting for his job at the GM meetings. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I wonder if that's that's the reason why Rizzo is is going back to New York because there's stability there in New York. He knows what to expect. He just hit 32 home runs, and yes, you know, Houston just won a World Series, but. Obviously, you know, if he goes over there, Reggie Jackson might start yelling at him, you know, if, he, if he's not hitting home <laughs> runs. Um, you know, is, it's not that bad, if, you know, as the White Sox, is, if I'm hearing it, you know. I mean, if I'm Jose Abreu, it's like, no, I'm good. I've already been from, to a dysfunctional organization. I don't need to move to another one, no matter the success or not. But, but does yeah, it prove Rizzo- that, like, the White Sox front office, as messy as it can be, can win a World Series if the talent's good enough? <sighs> yeah, but it's like... That guy and Kenny Williams deserves more credit than he get than he gets. Deserves credit for working under the parameters that the chairman has given him and be- becoming a World Series champion. Probably, and I saw Dan Samborski the other day he said the White Sox in 2020, uh, 2005 were a 99 percentile team. They hit their 99 percentile with most of their players and their team. So it was a once in a lifetime thing, but also. Kenny Williams put him in that position to do it because he knew he couldn't go out and get the big money, so he had to do it via trades and trade people that would hurt. Carlos Lee getting off of his team to bring in the guy in front of me, Scott Pacetic, it's in that book right there in front of me. I thought you were pointing to Jose. Yeah. You know, those moves had to be made. And now you see Rick Hahn making a tough decision, letting Jose Abreu go. That's going to be a tough decision. Does he entertain? Maybe the guy on the left right there, Tim Anderson, in a trade. Does he entertain other people that will make this whole situation like very painful, like mine with Aloy Jimenez? That will be a very painful move for most White Sox fans, including me. But I think moves like that need to be made within the White Sox organization because you know you're not going to go and break the bank on free agents. Not even middle-tier free agents you're not going to break the bank for. So you got to get creative with trade acquisitions. Hopefully your minor league system is good. And then bring this... Uh, uh, you know, maybe Rick Hahn can find a way throughout this to have Pedro Griefall get these guys playing on 100% levels their whole time in 162, and maybe that'll make a difference because you know you're not going to compete with the Astros, uh, Yankees, Dodgers, Padres, all those teams that are spending real money. That's the thing. I look at these MLB trade rumors and all the things around here about free agent signings. I'm like, all the names, like Phillies, Braves, Padres, Yan- Yankees, Dodgers. Dodgers. And you finally get down to, like, the 40th free agent on the list. You're like, oh, White Sox have a chance with Jose Quintana? Let's go. Let's eat. <laughs> 
Well, we're, we're in that market finally. Uh, and you mentioned this, like uh, this just popped up uh, now that after Tyler Anderson uh, rejected the Dodgers qualifying offer and signed with the Angels for three years, thirty nine million. What? Yeah. What? <laughs> he got security. I get it, but nineteen million for next year to be on the Dodgers who re, re- revived your career, like the Angels. I get it. But you're only going over there to get hurt and be bad. He was non-tendered by the Giants after 2020. Yes. So, I mean, just like Carlos Rodon, he got security three years, making $10 million plus over three years. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it seems like a lottery lump sum versus, you know, million. taking it over. He could make $20 million this past year. He just made 39. Year. Huh? He just you, made 39. You capitalize on the the money while it's there. You you jump on that. You take advantage of that. If the Dodgers that. Yeah, want you. I saw that deal, that's, yeah. If the Dodgers want you, you go back. Well, here's what I'll go. I will go back. I was going to. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, the, the trade rumors and, and rumors. John Morosi uh, of MLB Network uh, said Justin Verlander to the Dodgers became more realistic based on today's events. Specifically, Tyler Anderson rejecting the Dodgers qualifying offer and signing Ur- Verlander would not involve the loss of a pick, whereas Jacob DeGrom would. Uh, so credit Ken Rosenthal for linking Justin Verlander and uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers. So, I mean, there there you go. The White Sox and uh, Russ did want me to say, you know, the Sox are not a serious World Series contender. Let's just stop that messaging now. I was just saying, you know, the Astros see all this dysfunction in their front office and we see all the White Sox dis- dysfunction like – it seems, especially after 2017 and then repeating a World Series victory in 2022, kind of gave Jay, uh, uh, not James Click, but Jim uh, Crane. Who? Crane. Crane. Uh, uh, Jim Crane, like these World Series goggles. And I think like Kenny and, and the White Sox also got that as well in 2005. And that's why it's been so difficult to replicate that success because they've been just trying to replicate that similar success where, you know, maybe we can get those guys all to their 99th percentile instead of actually going out and, you know, when the White Sox last year were linked to Justin Verlander when, right. you know, he was just trying to get more money uh, to resign with the Astros. Like, I, I do wonder if, you know, are the Dodgers going to get played here? Probably not because they're not going to mess around with a guy like Justin Verlander. The White Sox probably did mess around with a guy like Justin Verlander. He didn't end up coming to the White Sox. Manny Machado, they ended up messing around with Manny Machado and he didn't end up coming with the White Sox. Bryce Harper liked the White Sox pitch, but they messed around and didn't go out and get Bryce Harper. So, like, I, I guess that is the difference between – the White Sox, and, and maybe that is where that barrier for a re- World Series return needs to, to come. But the thing is, with the Houston, they have a dysfunction, and you see people move. Lunau got fired because mm-hmm. of his role in the cheating. Now you see this guy getting fired also. The same period of time, even longer, the White Sox have had dysfunction in their whole organization. Who's gotten fired? Who in the front office has gotten fired? Who is, they've been reshuffling the, ch- the chairs. Like, Hostetler's still there. Right. Like, uh, what's his name? Chris Getz, still there. Mike Shirley didn't mess anything up, but he's still there. Doug Lauman, I think, is still somewhere in the organization. Well, Rick Renteria got fired. Well, yeah, but no front office people are no, like, I know, hey, but like, hey, front office I'm, person, I'm get just, your ass out of here. I'm that's, just, that's not successful right there. The, uh, their minor league has been shite for the last, what, three, four years at least, minimum. Yeah. No one's getting fired. Well, no, I mean, well, not their minor league hasn't been that bad because it was propped up by Luis Robert and Aloy Jimenez mm-hmm. and Andrew Vaughn. Like some of these top, they, they did have top prospects, but like the depth was never. Yeah, there. that's yeah. They have top heavy, but nothing real. And how much of this is in a problem of ownership that, you know, if your approach to things has pretty much stayed unchanged for how many years now and yeah, you do a little shuffling of the deck there, but you know, I think we saw some of this with you know the whole weird Tony Larusa situation, which was just odd to be from the start. Hmm. Um, you know, I don't think any serious person thought that this was going to work out, and I don't think anybody is surprised by how it ended up. Um, and that seemed like a pretty clear case of Jerry Reinsdorf stepping in and saying, "This is what I want," and. You know, you have poor Rick Hahn introducing Tony LaRusso, looking like he's, you know, been taken prisoner or something, and you're <laughs> waiting for him to, like, signal for help. And you, you see just the difference in his attitude between that press conference and then what we saw with Pedro Griffol just here recently, where it seems like for the first time he was allowed to get his guy. So 
Well, it's like it was like when you finally get like a good girlfriend that you can actually bring home to your mom, and it's yes. like, see, yeah. <laughs> see, yes. I'm not stupid. Yeah, I yeah. found one. Right. Look, mm-hmm. I found the one. This yeah, right. is the good one. Yeah, and it. You know, at some point, don't you have to look up at the very top of this organization and say, that's the problem? Because going back to what we were saying earlier, you know, why do the White Sox insist on functioning like they're a mid-market team? They're not. You're in the third largest market in the country. You're Chicago, a city big enough to support two franchises. Mm-hmm. Um, the Cubs don't spend money most of the time like a mid-market team. They don't operate. They don't function like it. They have their own TV network. And here we are on the other side of town. Why the insistence on continuing to, to operate that way, especially when over and over again you're seeing that it's not working. Because it worked one time. Yeah. That's why. And that's it, – that, well, yeah. I'm, I'm guaranteed that's what yeah. Jerry is saying to Kenny and uh, Rick. He's like, hey, it worked in 05. And these people are like, it's different now. Much different, jerk. Now we can't do the same things we did in 05. We don't, I mean, we have a Carlos Lee type player, but there's no Scott Pesednik. There's no Luis Vizcaino to be had. There's no other players like that to be had. And that is that going to lift us over the top? No. Do it's, we have a Jose Contreras on our team already? Do we have our Mark Burley? No. Right. Well, and I, I want to build off the, the TV network point. It's like we, there's rumors now that Jerry wants to get his own TV network for the White Sox <laughs> and Bowles. But Good luck. you could possibly argue that that's just NBC Sports Chicago because he owns 50% of it. Rocky right. Wirtz owns 25% of it. NBC Sports Group owns the other 25% of it. Uh, the Bulls' ownership is split you know, 50, 25 and 25 between the, the Bulls and White Sox. But, um, I mean, he still has most control over that, that channel, and yet the White Sox have never spent over $100 million on a contract where, you know, the Cubs, you know, even before they were running Marquee and operating Marquee, Gave what one hundred fifty five million dollars to Jason Hayward? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were they were doling out those those bigger contracts. Jason or John Lester the year before that. There right, was, yeah. and it, you know, two things that are are coming to mind right now. Number one, you, it, it kind of feels like they're going to organization that needs that John Lester type free agent. You need that to happen. Mm-hmm. Should that been was Dallas like Keuchel. That was it. Should have been, yeah, yeah. But it, it that was like the domino that I think shifted the culture for the Cubs too, because you do see a lot where players are sort of they like the White Sox pitch. You know, we're sort of intrigued. I'm kind of interested, but then, you know, nothing ever. It just doesn't come to fruition. And then the other thing is, yeah, that this problem of it worked once in 2005, but. As we all know, the game has changed so much from 2005. The, we don't live in the same world that we lived in in mm-hmm. 2005. Right. You know, no one our our iPhones didn't exist back then, and so no Twitter. It's right, and so we might be back there it, <laughs> soon. Yeah. No right. Amazon.com neon lights where you can get your logo printed on. Uh, yeah. So, at at what point do you say, yeah, it, what worked for us nearly 20 years ago, of course it's not going to work the same way again because so much has changed and we need to change with it. Yeah. And, I mean, I, I took, give them some credit. Like, they, they have at least some of the state-of-the-art, like, training, uh, uh, you know, equipment. Uh, their pitch lab seems to be effective. Uh, I know that recently there was a write-up in Yahoo.com talking about some of the state-of-the-art, uh, uh, actually, like, uh, batting practice machines where they try to replicate arm slot and actual velocity um, so you could practice in the cage. Uh, And I know the White Sox have one of the earlier, I think, uh, adaptations of that. I don't know if they have the most up-to-date one uh, because that one's supposed to be – it's like the Mets and Steve Cohen, like, paid for it to be installed into the Mets stadium, Mm -hmm. but it's not something that you could take with where I don't know if they have something similar – uh, out in Arizona, but I mean, they have their own facility out there. It's possible that they might, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Like it's, it, it seems like they're still just not there yet. And people always look at the yeah. analytics department and Rick Hahn did defend that at the GM meeting saying like, Oh, well, we just don't list our whole analytics department in the media guide, which I think is true, but you there should. is postings on white uh for job opportunities for analytics department. So if you want to work for the white Sox in the analytics department, you know, go apply. Put your name in. Yeah. Right. That'd be cool. <laughs> I heard that there was an opening on the CHGO White Sox podcast, it's, and now I work for the Sox. And that's the thing. It's, like, so weird. It's uh, so secretive, as if they're the Patriots, as if they're, they're what they're doing 
is what everybody else wants to do, and you don't want it to get out. Oh, we're not going to list all our analytics people on the on the press box. Oh no, 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 no way. You, we don't want you guys to know who we have working for us. We have a secret here that's working for us to be mediocre for the last twenty plus years. Last forty years, we're going to Trojan yeah, horse you to mediocrity. Exactly. It's like why oh, be so secretive because it's not like it's working. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like they they're just. Like, I'm sure that they feel that they are successful businessmen and women in that in that uh, organization. But and probably think of the fans as just ungrateful people who just like the bitch. But I think White Sox fans are probably the most loyal because they've been dealt a bad hand time and time again by this organization. But they the organization uses that against them because they know we're not going anywhere. We're staying here. Where are we going? The Cubs? No, we're not doing that. We're not going to be Brewers fans. For the most part, we're White Sox fans. We're dying in the wool White Sox fans. So I, get, I guess it's kind of – it works against us, our loyalty, because Jerry Reinsdorf is not going to change the person that he is as he sees the zeros count up. And the – you know, he's the chairman of the board of Major League Baseball. He has everything he wants. A World Series championship, a bunch wow. of NBA championships. What else does he need in, in the world? Steve Cohen out of the MLB. That's the only thing Out that he. MLB. That's the only thing yeah. he 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 didn't he want. Couldn't get. He didn't want Mark Cuban in the league, and he successfully did that. And Steve Cohen, he was the only one devoted against his uh, in his uh, being of um, the Mets owner. So right. well, he wanted like, A Rod to be the owner of the Mets, yeah. and so he could control him, he can puppet him. Right. Well, and that's that. That was one. I think he called him his rabbi. A Rod called Jerry Reinsdorf his rabbi. His rabbi and Roger yeah. Bozard. But right, yeah, well, right. no, but in the, in some of these, this like crazy Instagram posts, Rodriguez called uh, Jerry Reinsdorf his rabbi. I'll find it. All um, right. When Jerry leaves this earth, don't be surprised if A Rod's our new owner. I don't. I would be surprised. And A Rod. Well, when group. do we think that's going to happen? I don't know. I'm not predicting his what death. No, not his <laughs> death. But do you think? I, do you think he sells the the team before no, that? No, no, I don't think so. I, I don't think so either. I think he would have done that by now if if that was something he had any intention of doing. I think he'll he'll go on owning the team until. But the rumor about the the team owned network, I think that would make sense with a a White Sox sale, just because if they were able to set that up, then I think he would be yeah. able to establish and root like, all right, well, I'm going to get some sort of money forever now from this TV right. deal because I'll always, you know, just sign that contract with me getting 25 percent or whatever. Yeah, and the overall value of the organization goes up when you have that attached to it. Um, well, and if yeah. Soldier Field moves, the new owner might want a new stadium. That adds the value. Right. So it might be, I don't know. It would be perfect for Jerry just to move from the Illinois Sports Authority owned building to the Illinois Park District owned building at Soldier Field. <laughs> it's like, um, I, have no, I have no stake in this. These are not my buildings, they're their buildings. And we're paying nothing in rent unless we hit a certain number. But that could be a new avenue for a new owner is oh, like, yeah. you know, hey, I'll, I'll go and actually pay yeah. for this stadium and then I'll, I'll start owning this stadium on the lakefront and make well, this a national landmark like Soldier Field was I like before the they I, fucked it up. I like the idea that we're seeing in the chat from Rusted, Michael Jordan by the team. No. <laughs> you yes, want the, that? Uh, I don't know how good of an owner he is. No, no. I mean, based on his, uh, his tenure as a owner in the NBA – um, yeah, not so much. It would be a fun story, but I don't. I don't think that helps the team at all. I'd be worried that he suit up. Like he he, he, do, he yeah yeah. Like I don't know. Like late September, he's like, what? I can't put a jersey on. Yeah, and come on, he throws on a helmet. DH for my dad. Thanks for listening, yeah. though. Who? My guy says the worst White Sox. Oh yeah, podcast. he was here recently. It's fine. Hey, I mean, you're, you're listening every day. That's for good. for I mean, I used to do uh, YouTube stuff back in the day in like college uh, and we didn't have like a huge thing not like the CHGO stuff like but we got up to like 17,000 subscribers and this just passed like I think we're close to 22,000 so mm-hmm. Scott shout out to Scotty Pod nice 21.9k um but like we were a lot worse because we got a lot more hate on the other one when mm-hmm. we had 17,000. Uh, okay. And, you know, we don't get a lot of hate on here. You know, I, I shout out to Matt from Oklahoma. He's Maz man. Like, Joe W. Sox has been in here before. Uh, Rusted's been in here before. Fred's always in here. Like, you know, we got our people. And, and, and shout out yeah. to our people because uh, for a ch- YouTube chat that usually has, like, over 60 people in it, it's pretty damn safe. So shout out to our people for and keeping I- it that way. I appreciate people on a November, you know, middle of November day right. that are tuning in to watch live. So, uh, thanks for being here. Yeah, 
it's, it's fun. And, uh, you know, the, the payroll might be smart, but uh, small, but uh, at least it is entertaining because uh, train wrecks can be, you know, hard to look away from. And, and that mm-hmm. could possibly be the White Sox in 2023. Or they could win 87 games. I have no idea. And, AJ, we will be talking about Jose Rodriguez and Brian Ramos. Yeah, taste. Why not it's after coming. the it's coming. The, uh, the the ad break? Uh, let's tell you about Green Ridge Farm, uh, Lawrence. If you want to go into the fridge and just toss me a sausage, that'd be great. Oh, um, hey, we hey, literally hey. have hey. Uh, like you know, like the deli meat drawer in your fridge. You could just pull that out and just imagine, like I think. 35 packages of sausage in there. It is All fantastic. Sausage. Whatever 35 times four is, that's a, as many sausages that we have in there. We have the uh, Polish style ones and the, uh, I think it's the jalapeno and cheddar one. Uh, here's my guy, Lawrence. And let's get this product on the camera. Here we go. It's, it's beautiful product. Um, it's, a, it's a smoked fresh Polish from Green Ridge Farm sausage. Uh, and I mean, the ingredients, you can all pronounce these pork, water, sea salt, vinegar, brown sugar, black pepper, garlic, celery powder, and pork casing. That's a, it's, I mean, there's nothing nice you know, not natural about that. And that's generations in the making, these fantastic recipes that you could find at Costco, you could find at Jewel, you could find at GreenRichFarm.com. They have a deal right now if you add any three meat products into your cart at GreenRichFarm.com and use code CHGO, you get a free pack of meat sticks in your cart. And these meat sticks are a game changer for me. Fantastic for lunch, snack, uh, and we have them at the tailgate as well. So definitely head out and check out these fantastic fantastic all natural snacks from Green Ridge Farm uh, Green Ridge Farm simply natural meat and again uh, use code CHGO at checkout at Green Ridge Farm uh, order any three meat products and include a back of meat sticks in your cart and those meat sticks will be free we're gonna jump in I, I was thought, not. Oh, I, thought you were gonna I, say something. I was just gonna say I can having now eaten the Green Ridge Farm meat sticks uh, I can attest to their their goodness like crispy like you know yeah. they got the perfect oh, yeah. snap all natural, the, the cheddar and the jalapeno cheddar one. Yes. And I appreciate something like that that has like four ingredients instead of all this other weird stuff packed in there. I right. like that. Simply natural. And I'm, I'm with uh, Rusted again. Real Chicagoans fill their entire fridge with meat. Yes. <laughs> um, people like, uh, I know people like to give uh, our guy, Shane, or, uh, our guy who we used to work with, Shane Reardon, a, a lot of uh, crap for uh, you know, being uh, a contact factory and being Shane himself. Yep. Uh, but I do have respect that in his closet, he has a meat fridge. Mm-hmm. It's like a, 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 just a true like stand-up freezer that is just full of meat that he has ready to, to make at any point. You know, it's pretty, right. pretty I don't think we can say any more nice things about Shane because Cody's getting angry at us. <laughs> <all right. laughs> That's fair. Uh, I was walking today. Uh, I know it was snowing out, but uh, I took a, like a three mile walk uh, w- w- with my with my girlfriend, and I was walking around. And I, I kid you not, when we read the Comet Energy Efficiency Program, when they mention the communities we serve, uh, save more energy and money. I am in uh, one of those communities. I pay my Comet bill, and I saw on my walk a ComEd energy efficient bill. And I didn't have the picture with me. Uh, so I'm, I'm waiting for the picture, but I took a picture with the truck. Cause I was like, Oh, they are in communities that they serve because I just saw them on the streets. So they're in the streets that you live on and they are trying to help you save money and energy. ComEd offers free facility assessments that can help you find energy saving opportunities, whether it's lighting, HVAC system, commercial k- kitchen equipments, or industrial processes. An authorized engineer will work with you to develop a detailed assessment plan specific to your goals and needs. These can be done in person or virtually and last approximately two hours. Within three to four weeks, customers will receive a report detailing energy efficiency projects that can start work that you can start working on immediately. Each recommendation will include estimated energy savings, cost savings, project costs, potential incentives, and simple payback. So don't wait. Get started saving money and energy today. For energy saving tips and to schedule your free facility assessment, go to comed.com slash powering biz. That's powering uh, B I Z, uh, and then ready f- to sign up for a facility assessment. Call one eight five five four three three two seven zero zero during normal business hours to speak with a Comed Energy Efficiency Program representative, or email business ee at comed dot com or request an assessment online on our website at comed dot com slash facility assessment. All right, so let's before AJ, you know turns off our podcast. Let's go Sorry, and talk AJ. about the 40-man <laughs> roster uh, here because that's what every uh, baseball fan wants to be talking about in November. Uh, 5 p.m. is going to be an important time uh, for MLB teams. 
All 30 teams have until 5 p.m. to make decisions about their 40-man rosters. Some prospects will earn a coveted spot, some will not, and thus be eligible to be picked up by another team in the Rule 5 draft, which is going to be taking place during the winter meetings in San Diego on Wednesday, December 7th, and how the 40-man roster rules or if uh, to determine if you are going to be Rule uh, 5 eligible. Uh, players first signed at the age 18 or younger must be added to the 40-man rosters within five seasons or they become eligible to be drafted by other organizations through the Rule 5 process. And players signed at 19 years or older have to be protected within four seasons. Club play Cubs pay $100,000 to select a player in the Major League phase of the Rule 5 draft. If that player doesn't stay on the 25-man roster for the full season, he must be offered back to his former team for $50,000. Um, your mean Mercedes is a player that came to the White Sox in the Rule yeah. 5 draft, but that was in the minor league version. But the thing about the Rule 5 draft with the lockout last year is that the major league portion of the Rule 5 draft was canceled and only the minor league portion was of the Rule 5 draft canceled, and that works a little bit differently. So if you're going to be drafted uh, from the minor league Rule 5 draft, you are added to the 40-man roster. But if yeah. you are drafted from the major league one, you are put on the 25-man roster. So if the White Sox were to select somebody in the upcoming Rule 5 uh, draft, they would have to keep them on the major league roster um, for this 2023 season, or they would be to returned to their, yeah. their old team. So uh, it's an interesting day here before we get into some of the players that could be selected or that have already been protected. Uh, how important is this day for major league teams and how have you seen it affect teams, you know, in, in the past, because this has been going on for a while. Well, and I think one thing that's good just sort of generally to keep in mind about this because I'm just I'm seeing a couple of comments about the Rule Five draft in general. Um, I think it, it's a good thing because it helps the players. It protects them from be from having teams just sort of hide them in their minor league system and just stash them away there forever. And it keeps a guy from getting stuck in one team system for years and years and years on end. So it is it is sort of a weird thing to follow. Um, but I think if you keep that in mind, like it's it's good for the players. Um, that's that's helpful and I think Sean to like answer your question I mean we see on large scale and small scale how a guy that a team acquires in the rule five draft can impact a team Mercedes is a good example of that because so much of the overall success that the White Sox had in 2021 is owed to how well they played early in the season in April and that's when your mean Mercedes was getting the burger right. named after him and <laughs> All that and so yeah, it didn't work out over the the you know the span of the whole season. But if you look at what he did those first month and a half or so, it did help the White Sox um, across the board. And so you have moves like that. If you go back a few years and you think about somebody like Josh Hamilton, who was a Rule Five pick, who ended up with Cincinnati because if I'm forgetting I think it was drafted by the, Tampa was released from that organization because of drug issues yeah uh, then came back to baseball but I think was still in the Rays organization but was unprotected and then, then picked, up picked up by up, Cincinnati yeah and then I think they traded him to Texas they traded him to Texas um but yeah so he's an and example then he signed of, a massive deal with the Angels and got hurt right like, and then, like, yeah. someone, I think you said what his uh his life has taken a turn since then, but yeah. but yeah, he's a good example of somebody who significant impact, um, an unusual story for sure. Uh, yeah, I see. I thought so. He was drafted in the Rule Five by the Cubs, and then the Cubs traded Josh Hamilton to the to the Reds, Reds like who then flipped him to to Texas. But um, but and yeah, then so he he was traded from the Reds to the uh, Rangers for Edison Volquez. Edison so, Volquez, yeah. that's right, and Danny Herrera. Um, so. More often, I think you see some of these guys that get moved in Rule 5 are, are more like the Yermin Mercedes-type players, but every once in a while, yeah, you get somebody like Josh Hamilton who really put together a decent stretch of, of good years when he was in Texas. It, it wasn't until he went to the Angels that, you know, issues started to pop up. But, yeah, so it, it is an important time, even if it does seem kind of weird. Yeah, and just doing a little research, I saw that uh, – uh, Johan Santana was a former Rule 5 draft person. Um, and in the version in 1954, Roberto Clemente was a Rule 5 draft guy. So you can get some people. You can get – these are, you know, the exceptions, not the rule. Right. For the most part, you're going to get these people, and they're going to be like, 
Luis Perdomo was when I was in San Diego. They picked him up for one year. I think they wanted to have him in the minor leagues. Then they worked out a deal. I forgot where they got him from. I think maybe the Mariners. So they worked out a deal where they can keep him on the team and then send him back down to the minors. And eventually he didn't turn out to be anything. But those are what Rule 5 drafts are like. You see a person out there, it's like, okay, he's just languishing on that other team's uh, minor league system. Maybe he can be the 40th man on our roster. He can make our team, and he can do some things as the 26th man on our roster. If we find, you know, we find gold, we find gold. If we don't, we just uh, send him back to the team that he was on previously. No harm, no foul. Well, and you could also just trade him. Like like the Cubs traded mm-hmm. Josh Hamilton. Uh, usually, uh, I mean, the Sox have done this with their past two players they select in the Rule 5 draft. They traded them for cash consider- considerations. So um, you could get something out of these players. But uh, the main thing with the Rule 5 draft being canceled last year is it's left a lot of players for this Bam. pool. And yeah. right now there are 14 players on MLB Pipeline, top 100 prospects who need to be protected or will become exposed to the Rule 5 draft. And again, shout out to MLB.com. For this list, um, it includes two top 10 players, Grayson Rodriguez of the Orioles. He's number four in all of baseball, uh, MLB.com's top 100 list. And then Diego uh, Cartaya, uh, the catcher for the Dodgers, uh, he's number eight. Um, recently, Owen White of the Rangers was just protected, um, but that list struck from 15 to 14 after that protection. But Brendan Davis of the Cubs um, is still yeah. exposed technically, I think. The assumption is that he's going to be protected. Yeah, protect but, him, but if yeah. a guy like Brennan Davis was out there, right? You know, I'm not saying the White Sox would be able to get to him because that guy's probably getting drafted immediately by the first team. But um, you know, that would be huge if a player of that caliber was made available in the Rule Five Draft. Yeah, it speaks to how deep this Rule Five Draft is this year. Yeah, and I'm just looking at a thing from Anthony DeComo on his Twitter. Bit of surprise here is the Mets are not making any 40-man ads before this evening's deadline. Outfield d- defensive whiz Jake Magnum and among, among others will be exposed to the Rule Five Draft. Yeah, so d- all their all their people on that list will be expo- exposed and ready to go. Their list includes Junior Santos, who's number 16th, Jordani Yord, uh, Ventura, who's number 20th, Stanley Consor. Hansu Guerra, uh, number 23rd, and Javier Atencio, uh, left-handed pitcher, who's number 29. So I don't know if that's that's massive news, but it, it is interesting. Uh, the White Sox, though, let's get into how this will affect the White Sox. Uh, so the Sox had four players who were uh, up for the decision whether to be added to the 40-man or to be exposed to the Rule 5 draft. Uh, and those were Brian Ramos, third base prospect, who is number five in MLB.com's top uh, 30 for the White Sox prospects. Jose Rodriguez, a shortstop prospect, who is number seventh for MLB.com's top 30 prospects for the White Sox. Luis Meeses, uh, an outfielder, who is number 21 on MLB.com's top 30 prospects for the White Sox. And Gilbert Sanchez, a uh, shortstop slash second baseman, who is number 20, 26 on the top 30 uh, White Sox prospects list uh, for MLB.com. And Gilbert Sanchez, a former major leaguer for for the Sox as well. Um, but the White Sox have now secured Brian Ramos and Jose Rodriguez onto the, uh, they have selected them, selected their contracts to join the 40-man roster. So White Sox fans don't need to worry about Ramos and Rodriguez. But first, let's talk about Yolbert Sanchez. Um, is it is it, you know, I don't think he's that enticing, but no. if they lose Yolbert Sanchez, is it that, you know, no, they have drastic? A, they have a glut of second base shortstop types up at the level. I mean, we saw last year when they brought up Sosa, like, they brought him up over Sanchez. They were like, okay, Bennett Sousa, or Bennett Sousa, <laughs> Lenin Sosa, you're our guy instead of Yolbert Sanchez. So that already told me something, how they feel about him. Then they sent Sosa back down to AAA and had to share time with Yolbert. So he's probably, you know, not going to hurt anything. It's not going to be a thing where you're, oh, man. Wish we had Yolbert Sanchez, like, three, four years from down the line. It's like, he'd probably go on to a decent MLB career eventually. I think he'll get picked because he's at a level where he's ready to compete and ready to contribute to a major league team. He can be a fifth infielder for a team and be pretty productive. It won't hurt the White Sox. There's that glut I told you about that I think they can just go to if they need a second baseman after you know free agency calms down and trades don't work out, and they say, okay, our second baseman are Danny Mendick, Sousa, or Sosa, and Larry Garcia, who we're going to get to in a second. White Sox fans like, ugh, but also like, ugh, it's fine. Second yeah. base, what, you know, what, right. what are we really losing? We're not losing this power-hitting second baseman and Yolbert Sanchez. 
I think he'll get picked, though. And he might not be the, even the best prospect because we need Sosa hit, you know, 23 home runs or whatever in double A AA and triple A. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't. It's somebody that they're probably not even going to miss. And your needs at second base right now are somebody. You, you, you need a consistent presence there. I, I think it's a, a deeper need than what he, someone like him is going to be able to fill. I don't, I'm not even sure Sosa's there yet. So, you know, if they're trying to fill that spot on their roster um yeah Sanchez isn't a guy that you're gonna miss and he probably you're right he probably will get picked up the fact that he has some major league experience is going to be enticing to someone um but yeah I don't don't think the Sox miss him at all right Uh, and depending on how deep this is it might not be that interesting because again if you're picking up a player like this they have to be on the 26 man roster and the A's can afford that the Pirates can afford that but you know I, I think the White Sox their guys just won't be that enticing for, for them to, to, to go away. Uh, last player that was selected in the Rule 5 draft for the White Sox was A.J. Puckett. He was selected by the Braves uh, in the minor league Rule 5 draft, and last year he put up a 736 ERA in double A. Uh, so that's not Ouch. too rough. Did they, to, they have to work out a deal, or did he pitch a whole year with the, uh, with the team before he got sent back down to the minors? Or are you talking about the minor league? This was the minor league one, okay. so he was on the just the, uh, the, the 40 man. Um, but there was also some news from Robert Murray of Fansided. Uh, Ex-Mets, Nate Fisher, left-handed pitcher, uh, kind of a starter reliever in the Mets organization, uh, has signed a minor league deal with the White Sox. I believe he's on the 40-man roster as well now. Um, but Nate Fisher had some time with the Mets. Uh, I'm not going to ask you guys about your Nate Fisher thoughts because I doubt you have any. Uh, but an interesting story because he was formerly a banker. Uh, so Fisher, who was cut on Monday, roughly 24 hours after tossing three scoreless innings against the Phillies, cleared waivers on Thursdays and stayed with the clubs after being uh, designated for assignment per uh, Jason Resnick of MLB Pipeline. Uh, the 26-year-old's lefty effort became the talk of Sports World Sunday after fans learned F- uh, Fisher worked as a banker at First National Bank of Omaha just prior to returning to baseball last year. Uh, so he was in Nebraska, uh, the Lincoln, Nebraska uh, baseball team, Big Ten, uh, pitched there for five years, was undrafted, uh, was then picked up by the Mariners in 2019, didn't play in 2020. So yep. what do you do? Came a banker. Uh, and then was picked up by the Mets in 2021, uh, and then in 2022 stayed with the Mets and uh, then made his way up to uh, major leagues. They used him in August for a game, sent him back down to AAA, but um, he's had some really nice numbers over his career. Left-hander, uh, throws a four-seam fastball, a slider, change-up. Uh, he's got a fourth pitch as well. Uh, but you look at his uh, fastball and his fastball spin, it's a guy you wonder if Ethan Katz is able to get a little bit more with his core velocity. He's able to add a little bit more speed to his fastball, uh, and they're able to fix the uh, rotation of his ball and make sure that he's getting a more active spin because I think right now it's at like 94%. So if he's able to add more velocity and he's able to maybe adjust the, the grip on that pitch, maybe he's a guy that's able to do something for the White Sox. So uh, I do think that Tanner Banks, though, is going to be a little bit jealous because Banker and Tanner Banks, left-hander, and we already have – it's like a one limit on Cornhuskers who are left-handed in the bullpen. We already got one. Jake Diekman's coming <laughs> back for the 2023 <laughs> season. So it'll be a little much to add another one. It's like, oh, God, we're adding this guy too, the banker, to give up a bunch of runs here at the at the guaranteed rate. Yeah, uh, four, four uh, seam fastball slider change curve. Thank you, JJ, for that. Uh, but he's from Utah, Uton, Nebraska. Uton? Uton. Y-U-T-A-N, Nebraska. Uh, it's a city in Sanders County, Nebraska, and the population is 100, uh, 1,174. So 1,174 at the 2010 census. I'm going to take a stab and say that Uton has produced only one major league player. I and it's him. Don't, yeah, uh, his high school didn't have a Wikipedia page. Hmm. So it was just a red link, which is uh, never good. Um, Last year, uh, over two teams in the minors, uh, a 415 ERA over 84 and two-thirds innings. Uh, The White Sox really struggled with pitching depth, and uh, this might just be exactly what they need uh, in some pitching depth, but it's a nice little angle for the White Sox uh, just because he's he's a banker. Um, but anyways, Brian Ramos being added to the 40-man and Jose Rodriguez being added to the 40-man, I think, are the big headlines. Uh, let's take a quick ad break, uh, and we'll do that, uh, and then we will get out of here. We also have a little bit of uh, Leary Garcia report cards, but uh, that won't take too long. Uh, we'll the, be efficient on that one. 
and they're both young. It made sense to, for those two to get uh, put to the 40-man roster other than the other guys who are available and now are exposed to the 40-man or to the Rule 5 draft. Right. Uh, and, and two, I mean, the, the White Sox, I think, had 36 men on their 30, uh, 40-man roster before this. They had space to add these two guys, and there's also some just – We've talked about this before. There's some fat on that 40 man roster. Uh, Jason Billis uh, and shout there? out to S- Sleepy Harold. He's still there. Uh. Um, he, I think he had like a, a, a 10 ERA in Charlotte. Uh, and it, you know, it's it's tough to truly judge these guys because the White Sox pitching depth was so thin it's be this year. To somebody. Um, he might be related <laughs> to somebody, but he had a five ERA I think in uh, in Birmingham and then a 10 ERA in Charlotte. So uh, definitely not a guy that uh, is getting a ringing endorsement, at least from me. Uh, but let's take a quick break. Game Time is the hottest new ticketing site that makes it easier than ever to score deals on uh, tickets to sports, concerts, and shows. Hey, maybe you don't want to spend, I don't know, your whole morning, afternoon, evening sitting in a, a, a certain bank's ticket master line for a certain pop star who's having an era's decade tour, right? No one likes that person anyways. I disagree because my girlfriend does and no one does. it's it's very apparent in my life that people do like taylor swift mm. so uh I, I, I might cool it on that one grandpa she's gonna um, sing a song about breaking up with somebody again right yeah i mean that's that's most songs it's, it's good material these tickets yeah, are good. actually not that expensive considering it's taylor swift um these what, are not that bad is, what are they the what site? are they right now i can't even see it's uh so what is it she's gonna be in soldier field for three days yeah for three days and the tickets are um Four hundred bucks. Yeah. Well, so <laughs> what? what I, I paid six hundred dollars. What I've heard is <laughs> floor is going to be uh, floor is going to be nine hundred. Kids. Level one hundred is going to be like around five hundred, and everything up is going to be. Yeah, I, w- I wouldn't so, even go. I don't like. Um, I don't like. Tickets. I don't even know how those people have tickets yet. But uh, those, anyways, do uh, they like? Does she personally come down and say what's up to you for four hundred dollars? No. Um, I ain't going. Sorry, but, Taylor. But anyways, if you are looking for a, a <laughs> big event, if you are looking for tickets to a big event, the biggest last-minute price drops can be found on seats you never thought you could buy. So all you have to do is be patient for Taylor Swift and then buy it the day of, and you'll have a blast uh, hanging out there at Soldier Field. But you could also hang out uh, with us at the CHGO Tailgate. We are having a next one, our next one on December 4th for the Bears-Packers game, and you can find last-minute price drops on the Bears-Packers uh, t- game on December 4th as well so you won't find a better deal this season on uh hey taylor swift tickets chicago bears tickets uh chicago bulls tickets blackhawk tickets it was created by the fans for the fans and that means they guarantee the lowest price so if you love chgo then you'll love game time the best way to support us is by buying your tickets to the link in the description join our 15 million people who have downloaded the game time app and score the best seats to all your favorite events what's her fans name swifties yeah swifties yeah mm. yeah you have Rick and Morty made an episode yeah, about I it. I bet your household's got yes, fans. You'll hear no <laughs> ill will towards Taylor Swift from me. I would I'll agree with that. that. It, it's, yeah. it's helped me a lot of nights. Yeah. Thank so. you, Fred. You better write a song for me if it's $900. <laughs> That's what I was Personalized <laughs> song, <laughs> yes. Sunshine Herb. It's, it's good material. <laughs> um, next up, though, uh, it, you know, when Herb's bringing his sunshine, you'll need Shady Rays. Uh, and they never understood why sunglasses were so expensive, so they set out to change it. You don't have to break the bank for quality sunglasses this fall because our friends at Shady Rays have you covered. Shady Rays are premium polarized shades featuring world-class optical clarity, substantial durability, and styles cater to everyone and every lifestyle. The best part about Shady Rays, they have the most insane protection program in all of eyewear, lost and broken replacements. If you lose or break your shades on day one, they told us that they will send you a brand new pair, no questions asked. If you drop them in the lake, you've dropped them off the Soldier Field upper deck while you were cheering on Taylor Swift. Uh, you know, they'll replace them, no questions asked. And even with that strong of a protection program, they still manage to make quality that I can tell when I've held them in my hand. And they're just as good as Herb's one that he got, you know, fitted for himself and his his, uh, his actual prescription, right? Yep. Same exact quality when you're holding them in your hands. And Shady Rays customers seem to agree as they have given over 200,000 five-star reviews to Shady Rays. So exclusively for our listeners, Shady Rays is running their deepest deal of the season. Use code CHGO for 50% off two or more pairs at ShadyRays.com. Buy one, get one free. You can get two pairs off. Uh, uh, two pairs for as low as $54 and redeem only at ShadyRays.com where you can find all their newest and best Shades. And then finally, our friends over at FOCO are offering you some of the lowest prices and the best deals on the sports gear around. They've got you covered from Soldier Field to the living room, north or south side, with hoodies, slippers, signs, bobbleheads, and everything in between. Get decked out like DeMar with apparel from leaders in sports merch and collectibles. FOCO, that's F-O-C-O. 
If you're looking for the perfect gift for the football fan in your life, Foco's got you covered with hoodies to fight that Lake Michigan breeze. So check out Foco.com, that's F-O-C-O.com, or click the link in the description below. For all non presale items, use promo code CHGO for 10% off all right so brian ramos and jose rodriguez um definitely guys that are exciting players i think that if they were available in the rule five draft would have gotten drafted uh, by some team and i think it's just good because the white Sox at least could go out and trade some of these players um right ramos and, and rodriguez could get you something uh, in august rodriguez had nine home runs and brian ramos uh by Sox machine standards had him as the top three prospect for the Sox in their latest uh, rankings that came out in the midseason. So uh, I don't think I have any qualms about them protecting them from the Rule 5 draft. Anything else you guys want to add in about Jose Rodriguez or Brian Ramos? No, I just think that uh, it was smart for the White Sox to keep those guys because their numbers are projecting, and they're still young, very young. I think Ramos is 20, and I think Rodriguez might be 21. Mm -hmm. And so very young in the system and, you know, could grow and be uh, – a or diamond in the rough later on. Ramos Moore, I'm looking at uh, as a guy who did well down there in uh, Birmingham last year and got, a, I think, a cup of coffee in AAA. So he might be a couple years away, though, like just on the precipice when that young, awesome. Yeah, and some notable uh, Rule 5 players that were selected by the Sox. Uh, it was uh, Dylan Covey uh, might be the, the most recent one, Jason Grilly, and then also uh, Bobby Bonilla back in uh, 1985. So uh, it's not like, you know, it's, it's nobody. Bruce Kim as and they well. They traded Bobby Bo. Yeah, but they selected him, you know. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, at least the White I Sox. I think that was Hawk Harrelson did, like, did Mercy. all that damage. Did the Bobby Bo trade and fired Tony La Russa. I'm fine with firing Tony. I'm fine with the, them firing him twice. I mean, I have no issue with that uh, because he started Leary Garcia about like 82 times at second base this year. Uh, let's go into our final report card. Uh, Leary Garcia, the five and a half million dollar man, the 15 million dollar man, the legend himself, the longest tenured White Sox. He's been here since 2011. His offense, he's going to get an F. His defense, he's going to get an F. And his overall, he's going to get an F. Uh, I know that's a stuff slash commands and results. Uh, that's my bad for not communicating that. That's it's, fine. it's my bad. He I was a bad pitcher, to too. He was, he was an awful pitcher. Just um, bad. Yeah, he would have been bad in any uh, situation, at least in a starting situation. Uh, Leary Garcia is not a starting second baseman, and we saw that once Miguel Cairo took over as his, ench his ass basically got benched. Yeah, and that is the exact spot Leary Garcia should be. On the bench, giving you quality at bats when he is asked upon, when he's pressed into duty, like he has been. The White Sox have seven games in their recent playoff history. Larry Garcia has started six of them. So that is an indictment on both the coaching staff for Tony to play him that damn much and also Ricky Renteria to play him that damn much. And then the depth not being as such where Larry Garcia has to start a Major League Baseball game for you firstly, and then that Major League Baseball game being in the postseason. So it's great that he is put back into his regular spot, fifth infielder, fourth outfielder, occasional at bat, a Sunday off for Tim Anderson, cool. Larry Garcia is in that for that day. But I don't want to see Lurie Garcia three times a week like we did with Tony, sometimes more. So, yeah, he deserves his F, and I'm not mad at the player because the player has the limitations. He's not putting himself in the lineup. I'm mad at the team that continues to have him on the team and paying him way over market value where no one else would even get came close to a multi-year deal to get Lurie Garcia $16.5 million for three years. Yeah, he is the definition of – depth utility type player uh, and that's how he should only ever be used and when you put a guy in a position where he's not well suited of course it's not going to work out um, it's true for all of us so yeah I think you put it perfectly I'm not mad at him he's not been used the way that he's supposed to be used so hopefully now going forward you see him as your back end of the the, the bench in the dugout there called upon every so often to spell somebody, but that's it. Hey, I, I will say it's not that bad because he's not technically the worst player on the White Sox. Uh, if you are sorting by players who have 300 or more at-bats in 2022, Yasmani Grandal had a worse baseball <laughs> reference war at negative 1.4, and Yasmani Grandal was the third worst player in wow. baseball, only behind Darren Ruff of the Mets and Giants and Cole Calhoun 
of the Texas Rangers, but also in that uh, that bottom five, Spencer Torkelson just outside of that, uh, Nick Senzel, who is a former top prospect. Obviously, El Garcia also in the top ten mm. as well. Uh, and hey, you know we talk about him as a legend, Leary Garcia. He is a legend. Had that huge game three home run in the uh, the ALDS in 2021, and he had the same war as Miguel Cabrera in 2022. So. Mm. Gavin Sheets also bottom 20 in, in war. Yeah, he wasn't. That's why I say when people are like, man, Gavin had a good year. Like, he had a good year relative to his rest of his, rest of his White Sox teammates in home runs. That's it. Otherwise, Gavin Sheets was pretty bad. And so, yeah, we're judging these people on the wrong categories. Like, Gavin Sheets was not good. Gavin Sheets is going to be based on if he's better or not than Oscar Colas. And if he isn't, he's not going to be on the White Sox team. Uh, but yeah, that's going to do it for the CHGO White Sox podcast. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in, even though this is the worst CH, uh, the, this is the worst uh, White, White Sox, Sox podcast. podcast. Yeah, it the, is the worst White Sox podcast. Uh, thank that's you very much. For hey, I'll take it. it. As long as you're listening, we'll that's continue right. being the worst. Right. Uh, and we appreciate our uh, very, very loyal uh, uh, listeners to this awful, awful podcast, like AJ, Rusted, JJ, uh, all of our fans that usually hang out uh, here as well. And thank you to Jared Willis for hanging out with us over the past two days. Uh, and shout out to Fred as well. Make sure you follow Jared on Twitter at JS, J Willis, uh, wise instead of eyes. Uh, he's our CHGO beat writer for the Cubs and Sox. Shout Thanks, out to Schlesh. Schlesh Poppy as well. Uh, that's Herb Lawrence. You can follow him on Twitter at Eckernwall23. He's our CHGO White Sox community leader. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the CHGO White Sox podcast. Oh, our guy Herman is in here as well. Oh, uh, thank, thank you for you, the super chat. super chat. Uh, $5 for having the ability to discern. Leary over the three seasons prior to this one was very solid versus the utility guy. Um, plus speed and switch hitter. He also was playing hurt. I mean, there was the at-bats in Kansas City where, like, <laughs> I mean, he was swinging with one knee. Like, I, it was ugly to watch him play, and I hated that they signed with his contract, but, like... It was like punishment. It, it's yeah. weird that they made Leury Garcia the longest tenured White Sox when Jose Abreu could have been that. Like, it's weird that they really wanted to keep Leury in the clubhouse, but they're not doing that for Jose for Abreu. Jose Abreu. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, that that's where I get upset with Leary Garcia, but that's not Leary Garcia's fault. No. Yeah. They're like, here, Leary, here's 16 and a half million. Shit. He's like, <laughs> he signed that with a quickness. Yeah, right. I'm good. He was like, you sure Pittsburgh wants me? <laughs> yeah. He's like, all right. So that's who, good. Yeah, who's Leary's agent? That's who I want as my that's, agent. That's the real hero. Yeah, that's right the real hero. Yeah. Uh, I mean, shout out to Herman. Uh, appreciate that super chat, and uh, we appreciate you guys uh, supporting us as well. And uh, shout out to AJ. Uh, we appreciate all the love. I'm Sean Anderson. You can follow me on Twitter at Sean underscore W underscore Anderson. Thank you to Sarah for producing the show, and we will talk to you tomorrow. You're at 4 p.m. for the CHGO White Sox podcast.